Right. Thank you very much. So, hello everyone. I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Dominic and I will present you a very long title tonight, which is Developing a Privacy-Aware Map-Based Cross-Platform Social Media Dashboard for Municipal Decision-Making. But just keep in mind Privacy-Aware and Social Media Dashboard. That's the two things that I will talk about tonight. So just some words about me. I'm a PhD student at the TU Dresden and I work for a GB Consite as well as a joint research center of the European Commission. And my main research interest lies in geomatics and geospatial data science and programming as well. And that's the reason why I'm here, of course. Um, and if you're interested, um, just check out my blog where I just um, frequently post something about our work, about privacy, about data, etc. So more or less everything that we'll talk about tonight is also on my blog in split up in small portions that are easy to follow. Okay, so what you're learning today is basically three things. So first of all, I will talk about LBS and structure, which is location-based social network structure. It's basically a, a, basically a, a package um, in order to split up social media posts and to streamline social media posts from different platforms. The second thing that you see here is hyperlog log that you probably never heard of. Is there anyone who heard ever of hyperlog log before? No one, that's great. Um, so I can explain it to you very well. And the third and last thing is LBS and dashboard, which is the front end for the structure that we developed here. And that's actually the thing that you see on the right, but we will go more into detail later on. So let's start with social media. Location-based social networks is a very long title for the most common um, social media platforms that we use, like Instagram, Twitter, Flickr, TikTok, even YouTube, like all of those platforms, they tend to have some kind of geospatial information attached, like a coordinate, an Instagram location, or something that indicates some specific um, location for the data that is posted there. Let's say, for example, from an Instagram post that is tagged with um, Phos4G, for example, with a location here on site, and maybe people say, oh, it was great. Okay, so you have this information and a particular geotag, meaning it's taking place here at Phos4G, for example. And LBSN structure is basically a common language independent cross network social media data scheme. And what does it want to do? The question is very simple how to standardize all the different APIs from these platforms? Because, for example, Flick uh, Flickr has a public API, Twitter has also a public API, as well as Instagram. And all these APIs are pretty different. So if you take a look at, for example, um, this API over here, the result of the Instagram API, there are tons of different nodes. And all of these APIs are different, of course, and they um, return different JSONs if you query it. And the idea is to find a way to standardize all these different um, data that is being returned by these APIs. And the answer is actually pretty simple. So if you take a look at this data scheme here, um, it's basically splitting up each individual social media post into four different facets. These facets are these pyramids that you can see here. So it's, for example, the spatial facet, the temporal one, the topical one, as well as a social one. And each of these facets ha have different granularities. For example, the spatial one is pretty simple to understand. So you have a country at the very top, then a region, city, a place, and then maybe let long. So for example, if you would tag Phos4G, this would mean a place, or if you would even add a location, like right here um, in this building, this maybe even have some kind of let long attached to it. And the thing is very similar to temporal, topical, and social facets. So the idea is just to split up each post into the very tiny, almost atomic components. So for example, let's take this sample or fictional sample of social media post by Sunlover22. Um, that has some kind of text component and some kind of metadata. And all you do is you just split it up into metadata on the one hand, for example, a user ID, like sunlover22, a timestamp, as well as a location. And then, for example, if you take all the terms that are in the caption of this picture, for example, today, enjoying the wonderful on with, as well as the emojis, you have really the most atomic components of each social media post. And you can repeat this process with all kind of different social media platforms and divide each post into these tiny atomic components. So if you think about it, if you do this with all platforms, you end up with a database with all these like tiny, tiny fragments of posts. And then you can also put, for example, in one bucket, like so um, Instagram posts and Flickr posts, as well as Twitter posts, for example. 
Great, so this looks pretty much like this. So on the left-hand side, you have the different social media platforms that is obviously not limited to these ones here. And then you just split it up into these different facets. Great, so having this database, for example, you could already produce a nice front end and a dashboard that you could work with if you wanted to. But the main problem here is that there is no privacy at all included in this dashboard. So if you have a database with the original raw data and user, uh, user IDs, it's very detrimental for user privacy. And we don't want to put the user's privacy at risk. And that's the reason why we need to tackle privacy. And this brings us to the second part and the most important part of my talk, which is the hyperlock lock algorithm. So what is hyperlock lock? First of all, it's a probabilistic data structure. So it has nothing to do with the raw data itself. And as well, it's a cardinality estimator. So in other words, it's just a solver for the very particular count distinct problem. So for example, if I would count the distinct number of people in this room, I would end up with maybe 20. Okay, great. Um, but I could also count maybe like the amount of times that people went in and out. And this number would be not distinct, but it would um, count a different number. Hyperlock lock has some very um, interesting specifics. For example, a super low error rate of between two to four percent and a very low memory consumption. And by low, I mean really low. So for example, you can put one billion elements in only 1.5 kilobytes of data. So just think about of harvesting one billion user IDs and the amount of space it would usually take on a hard disk. Using hyperlock lock, it only consumes 1.5 kilobytes in this case. And last but not least, it's very fast. And what I mentioned already, it doesn't need to save the original data, but it's only a data abstraction in this case. Count distinct is actually a very hard thing to do for your CPU or your GPU because the way it works is actually more complicated than it looks like. So let's take this Python example in this case. So we have some array with repeating numbers like one, two, three, for example. And how you would do this is simply if you would count the total length of this array is just 10. So you can literally just query the length of it. But if you want the set, it's very computational and memory intense. So you need to consume a lot of resources to count the distinct elements because you always need to keep in mind the last element you that you saw and compare it to all the other, other following elements. And the way it works with hyperlock lock is different. It's actually more simple. So this is the hyperlock lock um, Python package in this case. And the way it works is you have this array and you create an empty hyperlock lock set and you add each element of the array one after another to this HLL set. This means that this is a linear process. And the moment when you add it, this hyperlock lock set grows, and you can immediately query the length of the hy uh, hyperlock lock set. And this is consuming way less memory. Why? We will come to this in a second. This is the algorithm. And I will not talk about this algorithm. Instead, I decided to bring you an analogy that is hopefully um, easy enough to follow. And I decided to bring in some Nintendo characters that you might know. And so let's just jump into it. So just imagine we had a huge, beautiful castle of Zelda, for example, and you see this gate here. Like there's the castle gate. And if you wanted to throw a privacy party, people need to jump or need to enter in this gate. And there are tons of characters and possible people that could join this party, for example. And all these people, they have different shapes, they have different silhouettes. And what Zelda is trying to do here, she's applying a very simple but yet effective trick. So just imagine this gate here was not a normal gate, but more of a video game gate. So what she forces people to do is not to walk through the gate and open it, but instead people just jump through it. They just jump through it, and what happens is they leave the silhouette in the gate. So when Mario jumps through the gate, you can see the silhouette that he leaves behind. It's this one. Now that's already very crucial to hyperlock lock. You will get to it in a second. So when more people attend the party, for example, there's Luigi joining the party and he's also jumping through it. And you see, we get a silhouette that is not corresponding too much. So before, if you take a look at the Mario silhouette, it's easy to understand that this is maybe one person or one character. Instead, if you take a look at the combined silhouette, it looks more like nothing, like you can't really tell what is in there. And if you make more characters join the party, like Donkey Kong, for example, Yoshi, Vario, and for example, last but not least, Peach, 
you end up with this bulky silhouette in this gate. And you don't really know who passed through that gate, unless you know the people very well, but you can only raise suspicion, but you never know for sure who passed through that gate. So what Hyperlock Lock is capable to do, taking this analogy, is brilliant, because Hyperlock Lock can estimate the number of unique visitors solely based on the ratio of the silhouette area to the gate area. So let that sink in. Hyperlock Lock can estimate the number of unique visitors solely based on the ratio of silhouette area to gate area. So for example, if roughly 80% of this gate is sort of cut out from the gate, in our analogy, Hyperlock Lock could estimate that there were like six people probably joining the party. So this is what Hyperlock Lock is capable of, only taking a look at this combined silhouette here. So there is no more information about the people itself, like there is no, they didn't leave anything behind, any traces that lead to them, but just a tiny fraction of each individual silhouette that combined leads to a different silhouette in this case. And this has very particular privacy effects. So if we take a look at, for example, the more the better. If you start with one character, for example Bowser, it's very easy to, uh, to see that one character joined this party. There is something else. If, for example, Mario would attend the party after Bowser passed, he could very simply hide in this silhouette and no one would know that he actually joined the party. So you can imagine, like, if the silhouette is growing even more, more people can hide in it and you never know for sure that someone really passed through that gate. There is actually one negative effect of Hyperlock Lock and that's the proof of non-occurrence. Just imagine that you had only the Bowser silhouette in this case and then Luigi is joining the party. You see that the silhouette changes and when the Hyperlock Lock set changes you know for sure that someone hasn't been there. So if for example in the very end of the party there's only Bowser silhouette but there's no trace of Luigi, one would know for sure that he has not attended the party. But on the other hand, there's also no proof of occurrence. So for example, if we had only this silhouette here and we forced Luigi to pass through that silhouette, there is a chance that he passed through it, but there is no certainty. And that's the main criteria of Hyperlock Lock, why it's privacy aware and protecting the privacy in this case, because you can never be sure who actually passed through that gate, and also the more it's growing, the safer it gets for the people. On the other hand, this brings us pretty much to the privacy dilemma, because if you have the raw data, and just think about all the amounts of the petabytes of social media data that there are in this world, if you have this raw data, you can perform spectacular analysis. But privacy is, of course, at risk, because you work with user IDs, with sensitive information. But on the other side, if you have no data, <laughs> there is 100% privacy because no one is working with the data. But if you want to still want to work with the data, but in a manner that privacy doesn't get affected badly, there must be some kind of middle way in this case. And this is where so-called probabilistic data structures like Hyperlock Lock or the so-called Bloom filter come into play and where they help out. Because they only take a fraction of, for example, a user ID and it's enough for Hyperlock Lock to estimate the number of unique elements. And that's the reason why we tend to call it privacy aware and not yet privacy preserving. Because if you ever hear the term privacy preserving, this corresponds to differential privacy, which is 100% private, which Hyperlock Lock in this case is not. And this is also what, of course, Desfontaine et al., what they claimed in their title, is cardinality estimators do not preserve privacy, which is true. If, on the other hand, you want to take a closer look at the privacy effects of Hyperlock Lock, check out the paper by Alexander Dunkel et al., which is the one down here, and there's a possible attacking scenario, so what could happen in the worst case. So what about ease of work? There is some very particular features to Hyperlock Lock that I will explain also with the silhouettes. If, for example, you take a look at this gate here, let's assume this one was the front gate, like the front entrance of the castle, but this one here was the back entrance. And at the very end of the party, you wanted to know how many people altogether joined the party. Like how many unique people joined the party. The way you do it is just to put a very simple overlay of these two silhouettes together, end up with this one, with this combined silhouette, and Hyperlock Lock is just doing its job. So you can always create lossless unions of Hyperlock Lock sets. On the other hand, you can also create so-called intersections. And for example, if you wanted to know how many unique people passed through both gates, like for example, front entrance 
as well as back entrance. So for example, coming in at one gate and also passing through the second gate, you can create these intersections. For example, silhouette one is the blue one, silhouette two is this orange one, and the intersection would be the red one. And Hyperlock Lock could estimate solely based on this red shape how many people walked actually through both gates in this case. So perfect, we come back to our LBSN structure. So think, think about these social media posts split into these tiny components of facets. Let's just translate this analogy to the real world. The gate in this case that you see here is the hyperlock lock set that is sort of um, retaining the information about, about the silhouette or about the unique number of people that pass through that gate. The silhouette instead is the unique user identifier or just user ID on social media. It can be your ID, it can be um, an email address or a phone number, it doesn't matter what, it just must be unique. And what we can do now is for every of these tiny atomic components of social media, for example, a very simple hashtag like Phosphor-G, we create an individual HLS set. So just think about this gate. We create this gate for every tiny fragment of social media, for example, for this hashtag Phosphor-G. We can do the same with locations like Piazza XY, for example, or the Phosphor-G location, the conference center, and you create this HLL sets for every of these tiny fragments. The cool thing is then you can combine them easily. So for example, if I wanted to analyze not only hashtag Phosphor-G, but also hashtag Phosphor-G 2022, I would just create the union and then have the, the summed up number for both hashtags and I would have the unique number of users on social media that posted something considering the hashtag, for example. Considering the locations, you could also work with H3, for example, or create some more aggregates, um, which would even benefit privacy even more if you would take not the Instagram for locations, for example, or really the, the location, like the coordinate, but instead use, for example, a raster or hexagons or something. This could be also done in advance. So we have our privacy-aware database, and what we can do now is we can query it. On the left-hand side, you see an example query that is actually pretty simple. So just querying the cardinality, remember the count distinct function, of, for example, the hashtags. What you see on the right hand here is the 23 most common hashtags um, that were fired in the city of Bonn, because this is my case study area in this case. And you see we have um, those kind of hashtags, like Bonn, Germany, Instagram is Bonn, love, Bonnstagram, etc. So th those hashtags have been used by roughly this amount of posts in this case, and we can easily look at like how Bonn is reflected on social media. Okay, so having this database ready, we can, of course, um, create an API. So we just head over to LBSN dashboard. This is a repository that you can look into. It's on GitHub and it's all open source. And this one here is just fast API and just creating a simple API infrastructure based on this privacy-aware database. Now, if you want to see it in action, and if you have, for example, a laptop with you, that would be better, just scan this QR code. You can even do it on your phone, but I promise you it's not optimized for mobile, so it will look a bit messy. Anyway, just go on this demo here, and you can check out how this dashboard works, actually. The QR code is also right down here, so just scan it if you'd like to. This is the interface of the dashboard. And let's start with a very simple example. For example, I just found accidentally, more or less, in my data set um, that for the Phosphor G 2016 in Bonn, I could see, for example, where people tended to post most posts on social media. And I didn't even know that it took place here in Gronau, which is where the conference center is. And it seems to me that most of the people posted something here but also, of course, in the city center of Bonn and also a bit in the outskirts, so to say. So you can see, for example, where the density of a certain topic is predominant. You can do the same if you zoom in, and these ones here are so-called hex bins or hexagonal bins that bin the amount of posts on the fly here, and you see that in this conference center there were most of the posts located. You can also perform some individual spatial queries, like draw your custom area of interest, and take a look at the rel relative distribution. For example, this is Endenich, like a, a part of Bonn. And what you can see here, there's one hexagonal bin that has 1,400 posts, which is a lot. 
and it's predominant for this whole area. And so we can look into it. If you look on OpenStreetMap, for example, we can see that there is the so-called Harmony. It's a concert hall where a lot of concerts take place. Or we can go a step further and take a lot of geometries. Like this one here is, for example, the urban green spaces of Bonn according to the municipal land use plan. And we could just take a look at the heat map, for example, where people tend to be the most. For example, we see here on the Rhine area, most people tend to chill here, but also on this green axis here, and the Rhine in general takes a huge spot in this heat map, for example. You can also take a look at the expense in this case, and you see that we have like, like three clusters, one here, one here, and one here. And so we can work with all of these different thematics, like technically doing different analysis, also for very specific queries in this case. So thank you very much, and I'm really excited for your questions, if you have any.